Okay, so uh, for next time, you're going to be reading uh, William Wordsworth's poem, Lines Composed a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey. So we're going to be moving from you know, like backgrounds of romanticism and origins of romanticism into romantic, uh, British romantic poetry proper. Um, I'm also going to recommend, though I'm not going to require, that you read the preface to lyrical ballads, which immediately follows lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey in the anthology, because it will give you some sense of what Wordsworth thinks he's doing in a poem like Tintern Abbey. What he thinks he's doing and what he's actually doing may not be quite the same things, um, but it's still, I think, useful for you to know um, how he theorizes uh, his poetic uh, method. Um, there are also, there's also the usual stuff on Georgia View in the content folder uh, for Wordsworth. They've got a podcast on Wordsworth, on romanticism, on the lyrical ballads itself. And I think there's a video in there as well. I can't show you any of this, of course, because uh, they gave us a new projector, you know, and in their infinite wisdom uh, seemed to have screwed up what was going on with the computer uh, in hooking it up. So. It's, it's there, it's installed, it looks great, uh, but I can't use it. Yeah, so anybody have any questions about anything? Okay, so let's just quickly review from the vocab quiz uh, for the weekend, and then we'll get into Oluwana and All right, so who can tell me what sensibility is? Yes, receptivity to sense impressions. Good. And what was the theory behind, like, what was sensibility supposed to help you do and develop? Empathy. Yeah, sort of empathy, sympathy, right? You know, benevolence, kindness, generosity. Right? So people who developed their sensibility were supposed to then kind of develop their moral and ethical nature as well, right? And what text is this most directly related to? This could have multiple possible answers. What's that? I've said the monk uh, reflections on the French Revolution. Okay, Just yeah. Yeah, um, Burke is trying to use sense impressions to get you to feel a particular way um, about his arguments. Um, I would have also um, accepted uh, the Coleridge essay on the slave trade. Um, you know, he's talking about how sensibility doesn't actually help you develop your own nature. And the feeling for a fictional character doesn't mean that you actually feel for uh, the sufferings of real people. But yeah, there, there are a number of different possible answers there, right? All right, what about the Royal African Company? What was the Royal African Company? It sold gold, silver, ivory, and slaves. Yep. Uh, active from the late 17th into the early 18th centuries, right? And what text would this be most, or text or texts would this be um, applicable to? Yeah, you have Clarkson's description of the Zong incident. Um, yeah, really Clarkson generally will probably be the most uh, relevant for this. What about impressment? What was impressment? Being forced into the military. Yeah, being forced to serve in the Army or Navy, right? Pressed into service. Um, only one person actually got the correct text for this. The text I was thinking of here for this was the Robert Southey poem, The Victory, right? Or it's mentioned that the dead person the poem describes had been pressed to the service, right? That he wasn't a volunteer. All right, what about rum and sugar? Yeah, 
yeah, these were useless luxuries, or at least from Coleridge's perspective, useless luxuries, right? Produced by slave labor in the West Indies that he was trying to encourage people to boycott, right? All right, good. What about the public sphere? What's the public sphere? Yeah, any kind of public space, whether physical or imaginary, right? Um, in which, yeah, ordinary people are able to participate in discussion of issues, right? So things like, you know, these kind of these corresponding societies that are letters to each other, coffee houses where people would meet up to discuss issues, um, even you know, things like newspapers and magazines, right? You know, popular media. Um, and I would accept just about any of the texts that we've read so far as applicable to this, um, particularly if they were distributed as, like, say, like a pamphlet or published in a newspaper. All right, what was the pro-slavery argument from Scripture? Now, remember, we talked about a couple of different pro-slavery arguments, and I'm asking specifically about the one from Scripture. piece on the slave trade, right? He argues that, well, the biblical patriarchs own slaves. Jesus doesn't say anything negative about slavery or slave owners. And if it was okay to own slaves then, then it must still be okay to own slaves now, right? Right, good. What about the Zong incidents? What was the Zong incident? Yeah, that's what we got. The captain of a slave ship called the Zong threw all of the slaves overboard, right? And what was he actually convicted of for doing so? Insurance fraud. Yes, insurance fraud, not murder, right? All right, Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. We all know that this was from the Clark's piece, right? All right, Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. What was that? Mm -hmm. Yep, it was yep, a, a group of yep, mostly dissenters with a few Anglican members. Right, and they were founded in 1787, um, and they were a lobbying group that uh, essentially looked like uh, try, was, they were trying to get Parliament to pass abolition. And the text I had in mind for this was the Thomas Clarkson text, because Clarkson was a key member of this group. All right, Atlantic Trade Triangle. What was the Atlantic Trade Triangle? Trade went from England to Africa to the Americas. Mm -hmm. Yep, and then back to England, right? And they're taking manufactured goods from England to Africa to trade for gold, ivory, spices, and slaves, which they're then taking to, uh, to the Americas, primarily the West Indies, picking up rum, sugar, and tobacco, and then taking those things back to England, right? And yeah, um, most of the, the, the text that we looked at last time would be relevant to this, but I think the most relevant would be the Coleridge because he's asking people to boycott something, right? So he's actually asking people to try to disrupt trade in order to achieve all right, and the cloud of dust. What was the cloud of dust? You can't see the vision of the Mm-hmm. And what did the cloud of dust conceal? What was actually going on with the slaves? Yeah, so it's in the Thomas Clarkson piece, right? He, just, he sees this line of slaves and chains coming towards it, but he just sees it as a cloud of dust, and it has to be explained to him what it is, right? Because he's looking for all right, good. So that takes care of that. So let's talk about all the wood equiana. What did y'all think of this? How'd this go for you? It was interesting to be able to 
So can, can, can you give me an example? Oh, like the clock and the painting and his bastard bedroom like freaked him out because he thought it was always watching him and yeah. following him around even though it was just a stationary thing. Yeah, let, let, let's, let, yeah let, let's go to the, I think page 106 or whatever you're thinking of. And can you, uh, can you please read the part for us that starts with, while he was fast asleep, I indulged myself a great deal. Down towards the bottom of the page. While he was fast asleep, I indulged myself a great deal in looking about the room, which to me appeared very fine and curious. The first object that engaged my attention was a watch which hung on the chimney in the study. I was quite surprised at the noise it made and was afraid it would tell the gentleman anything I might do amiss. And when I immediately observed after and when I immediately after observed a picture of me in the room which appeared constantly to look at me, I was still more frightened, having never seen such things as these before. At one time, I thought it was something relative to magic, and not seeing it move, I thought it might be some way the whites had to keep their great men when they died, and offer them limitation as we used to do to our fellow spirits. Okay, thank you. So let's sit on these for a second. So on the one hand, right, these are unfamiliar, right? But he also kind of associates them with surveillance. I think it's kind of you know, obvious with the painting in particular, right? It looks like it's actually, it looks like a person watching him, right? Um, does he, are there other moments like this in the narrative where you encounter something unfamiliar that doesn't really know what to do with it or how, you know, or how to respond to it? He was kind of put off by the lady working in the kitchen that had the iron thing over her face. Okay. To keep her from like eating and drinking and stealing. Yeah, well. Not stealing, but like taking the thing that she was supposed to cook for. Uh huh. Them. And what else does it, does it prevent her from doing? Speaking. It prevents her from speaking, yeah. So, yeah, on one hand, no stealing food, right? But also. No talking. Now we're going to sit on this one for a minute because this is part of another discourse going on in the memoir that I want to talk about in a minute. But <clears throat> what about if we look on page um, 107? Can I get somebody to start reading for us uh, from it was about the beginning of the, uh, the spring 1757? It was about the beginning of spring 1757 when I was out of and I was near 12 years old, 12 years of age at that time. I was then struck with the building and things of the streets and fall out. And indeed, any object I saw gave me a new surprise. One morning, when I got out from my bed, I saw it covered all over its foot snow and fell overnight as I had never seen anything of the time before. I thought it was soft, so I immediately ran down to the lake and the garden, and as well as I could, to come and see how somebody in the night had gone soft all over the day. He didn't know what it was, and I needed to bring some of it down to the other. Accordingly, I took up a lake full of it, which I found very cold and deep, and when I brought it to him, I needed to drive it from the city, or to him. Uh -huh. I did so, and I was surprised beyond measure. I didn't ask him what it was, he told me it was good. But I could not, anyone understood. Okay, thank you. You can stop there, right? So, he's also giving us details of his first experience with snow, right? And how is this experience with snow like the experience that he has with the clock and the painting? experience he has with snow here like the experience he had with the painting. What did he assume the painting must be? 
What's that? Okay, yeah, the painting is just watching him, right? That it's you know something that the you know the master is using for surveillance, right? But what else does he think it must be? Like a memoir of his dead. Yeah, like a, yeah, like a kind of like a, a way to preserve the de a, a dead person's memory, like his own people use, right? That would then be you know, you'd off you'd pour out libations, you like you pour you know alcohol. You know, propitiate the spirit, right? And what does he assume the snow must be? Oh. So what's similar about these two episodes, then? Apart from the simple fact that he's encountering something unfamiliar, what does he try to do with that unfamiliar thing? Relating it to something familiar to him. Yeah, he's trying to put it into a frame of reference he understands, right? As one naturally tends to do when confronted with the unfamiliar. Um, there's um, a passage in the 13th century Travels of Marco Polo, uh, where you know you, um, Polo was an Italian merchant who um, got a commission from the Emperor of China to wander around uh, the Emperor's domains and you kind of record for the Emperor we saw, right? And he talks about encountering a creature he calls a unicorn. But he says that this unicorn has thick, stumpy legs, thick, gray, wrinkled skin, and a single horn not in the middle of his forehead, but coming from the tip of his nose. What is he actually describing? I don't. Yeah, he's describing a rhinoceros, right? So why does he call it a unicorn? Yeah, because that's the thing that is most similar to this that is familiar to him, right? It's like, okay, like, I don't know what the hell this thing is, but I know what a unicorn is supposed to look like. So that must be what I'm dealing with here, right? So trying to put the unfamiliar into a familiar everyday frame of reference, right? But one thing that he also seems to take a lot of time to do here, right, especially in his description of snow, right? Does he just tell us that he has been corrected verbally and had it explained to him that this salt is actually snow? What else does he have to do in order to get the full experience here? Taste it. Yeah, he's got to touch it and taste it, right? He has to use his senses to directly experience it. So what's happening here is that he is presenting his own process of learning here through direct sensory experience, right? The overall process here we call defamiliarization. And defamiliarization is what happens when a writer takes something that should be familiar and mundane and ordinary to the reader and presents it in a way that makes it new in some way, right? So what Equiano was trying to do here is play on his reader's sensibility. Right? to create sympathy for the situation he finds himself in. <clears throat> right? He's hoping through the kind of shared, these kind of shared sense impressions, right? or this explanation of his sense impressions that the reader can then vicariously experience that this will build sympathy for his situation and for his cause, right? By creating a sense of common humanity, which was by no means universal among white Britons um, towards any people of African descent, right? And then there's another similar episode here that takes a kind of different tack. 
can I get somebody to read on page 108 the paragraph that starts with, I often see my master and Dick employed in reading. I often see my master and Dick employed in reading, and I have a great curiosity to talk with two books, as I thought they did. And so to learn how all things have been, for that purpose, I am often taken up a book to know the answer and talk to it. And then put my ears to it, let alone and hope to the answer. And I have been very much concerned when I found it remained silent. So what's going on here? What's going on with the book? Yeah. So, <clears throat> what's his interpretation here of the purpose of a book? To talk to it and give you answers. Yeah, you're, yeah, it's something you converse with, right? You can ask it a question and it'll answer you, right? And what's dismaying to him about his experience? With books, yeah, the, he's, he sees the book seeming to talk back to his master and to Dick, but not to him, right? This talking book paragraph is one of the best known in the memoir, and one of the most talked about, right? So. What do you think is going on here? Like, what do you think this means? Why is it important that he thinks the book is supposed to talk to him and it doesn't? Maybe because he's not good enough? He's not like on the same level as him? Uh, okay, so see, yeah, I've got a perception of his own inferiority that it makes him feel inferior to them. Okay, and I think that that is some of, that is some of what's going on here, right? Um, but let's think about this. Given what we know, like the one thing for sure that we know about Olauda Equiano, what do we know is one thing that he's done. What do we have physical evidence of right in front of us here? Something he's done. Yeah, he's written a book, right? Yeah. So we know that he can read and write. What's weird about the tense of this, these sentences about taking up a book and putting it to his ear? Does this sound like something that is happening in the past or in the present? Sounds, I would say, further present than it does in the past. That they kind of passed. It was like within very, very recent time, not like years and years ago. Yeah, he writes these sentences in present tense, right? Mm -hmm. Right, suggesting that despite the fact that he's clearly not only literate but eloquent. The book still doesn't talk to him. Now, we know that by the time he writes and publishes this, like he, it's not, you know, he doesn't misunderstand what a book is supposed to do or how it's supposed to work, right? But for some reason, the book still refuses to speak to him. And I think that, that a lot of it has to do with a sense of cult, like I think like to, to sort of like go back to what Jordan was saying about sort of inferiority, right? This kind of notion of you know not just inferiority but kind of cultural exclusion, right? That no matter how hard he tries to fit into British society, on some level, he's always treated as other. 
He's always going to be other in some sense. And this is, you know, even like kind of marked visibly on his features, right? If you look on page 109, um, the part where the, uh, the girl's mother is washing his face, right? Can I get uh, somebody to read from? I had often observed that when her mother washed her face, I had often observed that when her mother washed her face, it looked very risky. But when she washed mine, it did not look so. I therefore tried oftentimes myself, if I could not, by washing my face of the same color as our little playmate did. But it was all in vain, and I now began to be mortified of the difference in our complexions. So, even at the age of 12, right, do we think that he would have been naive enough to think that your skin color is something that just washes on and off. Yeah, especially given that, you know, he shows over the course of the narrative, even in his early life, you know, several you know, signs of intelligence, right? This is, a, this is a smart kid. So why else might he be talking about this idea of um, face washing. Why does this matter? Go, go ahead, Tom. If it falls along that line of that feeling of cultural exclusion, and not uh -huh. being able to match that collection of the other British people is just makes him feel even more ex excluded than he already does. Yeah, it's a con it's a conscious constant consciousness of difference, right? Constant awareness. Of his own difference. And we one thing that we have to remember here is that Equiano's difference from other Britons, right, is not just physical, it's legal. Right, so do we remember from last time when we talked about condition and state in terms of slavery? Anybody remember this distinction? Condition was the material conditions which, under which a slave lives, and the yeah. state was the legal status of a slave as a property owner. Yeah, condition refers to yeah, material conditions and treatments. And state refers to, yeah, legal status as property. And that legal status is something that can't be washed off with a face cloth, right? That legally encoded difference is something that no amount of trying to fit in is going to erase, right? No matter how he's treated, and the treatment we receive, he receives, we see is, even from the same people, kind of inconsistent, right? There are people who are kind to him sometimes and incredibly cruel to him at other times. Like, uh, you know, his, the, the, the person who owns him for most of his life as a slave, this guy, Michael Henry Pascal, the ship's captain. Who on the one hand, right, gets him baptized, teaches him to read, um, you know, and, um, you know, does other, you know, other, you know, prov provides for him in some ways, right? But also um, shows astonishing cruelty to him in other ways that we mentioned, like really. not least of which is you know he steals any money that Equiano earns for himself. So <clears throat> this condition of kind of like being in a society and always being the other 
and always being aware of your otherness is something that cultural critics call alterity. Right, this awareness of always being the other in a pair. It does seem like, in a lot of ways, Equiano tries to assimilate, right? Indeed, like, you know, once he has purchased his freedom, you know, he settles in London and marries an English woman. He adopts English dress fashions. Right? He writes in English. The name he uses as a writer is his uh, uh, his Igbo name, the name of the, the name he was given um, in the nation he was born in. But the name he continued to use socially and professionally, Gustavus Vasa, was the one that his um, that Michael Henry Pascal had given to him. So Equiano's relationship to Britishness and to British identity is really deeply complicated. Um, and one of the things that's most interesting about this guy, especially like in light of the whole talking book thing and the notion of alterity, is that Equiano is the first author in British history to undertake a book tour. about this for a minute. Why might it be important, or why might it have been necessary for Equiano to go before the public and read from his work when no one else, no other writer in British history had done a similar thing, just kind of going across the country and making public appearances? prejudices he describes himself uh, having to deal with even in the excerpts from the narrative that he read. Why else might it have been necessary for him to undertake a book tour? I'm going to uh, maybe give you a little hint here. If we look at the title of his memoir on page 106 and the last clause in that title, right? The interesting narrative of Olauda Equiano, or Gustavus Vasa, the African, written by himself. Because that general perception of that, um, former slaves are having it's not being able to read or write, and it was written by himself. Yeah, exactly. Because there were a lot of people making arguments that a black man could not possibly have written this, right? So. He's presenting himself to the public to show that he's not, you know, a puppet of white abolitionists. That you know, people he knew, like William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson, aren't putting words in his mouth or writing this for him. He's like, no, I mean, you know, these these are my words. These are my experiences, and that's what I'm putting before the public. So. This is one part of Equiano's uh, overall involvement in the public sphere in the late 18th century. Right? The fact he undertakes a book tour and you know, kind of puts himself 
out in front of the public. But he's involved in a lot of other um, enterprises after he purchases his freedom. Uh, one of the groups he's involved in is a corresponding society and lobbying group called the Sons of Africa. And the Sons of Africa uh, was a group of black British men, mostly around London, mostly in, in the area of London, but some out in other parts of the country as well, um, who wrote letters to each other and made alliances with other correspondents and, uh, corresponding societies, like uh, Clarkson's Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. And they also lobbied Parliament. Um, and members included, uh, in addition to Equiano, um, another prominent public speaker and memoirist by the name of uh, Otoba Kumuana. Uh, Ignatius Sancho, who was a business owner, a composer, and also the first black man known to have voted in a British election. He realized that because he owned his own shop, he owned property, and thus had a right to vote in parliamentary elections, um, even though the you know, people keeping the little book tried to turn him away. But yeah, he, he stuck to his guns, pressed for his rights, and he voted. And I would have been, I would have played some of Ignatius Sanchez's music for you uh, today at the beginning of class if the damn computer was actually working, which it isn't. So, but I digress. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> these guys have their fingers in a number of different pots here, right? One is a project to found a colony in what is now Sierra Leone. And uh, the capital of Sierra, Sierra Leone today is called Freetown. Um, Freetown was actually founded by the Sons of Africa and some of their allies. Um, their strategy was to try to either purchase slaves in various British dominions and send them to Freetown to live, um, or to help escape slaves to get them, right? So they tried to set up this colony that was specifically for former slaves. They also lobbied for the passage of a number of different laws. They were actually pretty astonishingly successful, right? Their first success in 1788 is the passage of a law called the Slave Act. And the Slave Act set limits on the number of slaves that could be transported on any ship. Right, so the idea was, okay, like if we can't get enough parliamentary votes to abolish slavery, perhaps we can at least mitigate some of the conditions that people experience on the Middle Passage, right? So, this is, you know, kind of only, again, only on the level of condition here, not really getting at the problem of state. But by 1807, the buying and selling of slaves in British colonies and in Britain itself is abolished. And it was called the Slave Trade Act. And 
And this was accomplished largely through um, lobbying done by groups like Equianos and by like putting these kinds of arguments and putting his own experiences in front of the public. Now one caveat I should um, note about this 1807 bill is that it didn't actually free any slaves. It prevented the buying and selling of slaves, but it wasn't until 1833 that slaves throughout British colonies would be legally granted the freedom. Essentially what the 1807 law, uh, even, the, even the 1833 law was flawed, but we'll get to that when we start talking about the early Victorian period. Um, but I think, you know, the, you know, the point I'm trying to make here is that Equiano's book and the writings of the members of the Sons of Africa and their allies made a difference here, right? That these men sharing their particular experiences actually did end up helping to move legislation. And there's also an increasing interest at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, in these issues of both personal freedom and in individual subjective experience. All right, so for most of the 18th century, writers tend to be more interested in broad kind of universal themes and ideas, right? Rather than in um, the experiences of the individual. But by the end of the 18th century, the individual and the individual's perceptions really kind of come to be the center of things. And so that's one of the things that makes um, Equiano relevant to romanticism in particular, right? That these are themes that are gonna be picked up by romantic writers. But I want to return to something that was pointed out earlier when we were talking about um, this defamiliarization process, right? So one of you mentioned the iron muzzle that prevented that female slave from eating, drinking, stealing, or talking, right? And this is also part of a discourse that runs through the whole memoir, right? So can I get somebody to read the very beginning here, page 106, we were landed up river, up a river a good way from the sea. We were landed up a good river a good way from the sea, about Virginia County, where we saw few or none of our native Africans, and not one soul who would talk to me. I was a few weeks weeding grass and gathering stones in the plantation, and at last all my companies were distributed in different ways, and only myself was left. I was now exceedingly miserable and thought my, myself worse off than any of the rest of my companions, for they could talk to each other, but I had no person to speak to that I could understand. In this state, I was constantly grieving and pinning and wishing for, for death rather than anything else. Okay, thank you. So let's let's stop there. Okay? So what has what is the thing that has in grieving and pining and wishing for death? He can't understand anyone. Yeah, he has no one to talk to, right? There's no one around who speaks his language, right? Now, on the one hand, what does this tell us about um, certain strategies employed by slave traders? You separate them and have no one they can talk to. They can try and rise up and push against the master. Exactly. You can disempower people, right? If you're grabbing, you know, people from various different nations who speak different languages, you make sure 
then you're not putting people who speak the same language together, right? If they can't communicate, it makes it harder for them to uh, foment rebellion, right? So this kind of silence is also a kind of, yeah, is also are meant to disempower and to discourage, right? Now, what about when he is sold to Michael Henry Pascal? What does Pascal do to him? On page 107. Yeah, he changes his name, right? While I was on board this ship, my captain and master named me Gustavus Vasa. So Gustavus Vasa, for those of you who don't know, uh, was a Swedish Protestant resistance fighter in the 16th century. Um, was kind of a like national hero of Sweden. It was fairly common for slave owners to give slaves ironic names like Hercules or Caesar or Gustavus Glosser. They, they like name them after these um, you know, powerful kingly figures as a, another kind of means of demeaning them. Um, yeah, so he decides his name is going to be Gustavus Vasa. I at that time began to understand him a little and refused to be called so and told him as well that I would be, as well as I could, that I would be called Jacob. But he said I should not and still called me Gustavus. And when I refused to answer to my new name, which at first I did, it gained me many a cuff. So at length I submitted and was obliged to bear the present name by which I have been known ever since. So what happens to him when he refuses to answer to the new name? When he speaks up in his own defense? Yeah. Now cuffed in this case means beaten. So when he won't obey, when he won't just be quiet and accept the name that's given to him, he's met with violence, right? And we're going to see Pascal do something similar when he decides he's going to sell it. somebody um, to start reading from in pursuance of our orders we sailed from Portsmouth to the Thames. Stop here for a minute, right? So he's decided he's going to dispose of Equiano, right? He's going to sell him. And when Equiano protests, you can't do that, I'm free, what does he do? He to kill him. Yeah, he threatens to kill him, but he waves his sword at him, right? So <clears throat> Pascal tends to enforce 
Ecuador's compliance and silence, right, through violence. Or at least the threat of violence. And that's the relationship here between um, what's going on kind of like in Equiano's life more broadly or in his own history and the iron <coughs> muzzle, right? So the iron muzzle may be a more obvious and more um, sort of clearly painful means of keeping someone silent. But he is subjected to other forms of violence to ensure that he keeps quiet as well, right? That he remains um, that he remains obedient. Um, this also kind of points to the fact that even though um, conditions were usually better for slaves who served on ships than slaves who served, uh, like say, plantations on land. Um, they were still subject to the same kinds of pressures that plantation slaves were. And right, their legal state is still the same. They don't have the right to refuse. Now then, we see here a little further down that the rest of the crew tells Epoiano they'll stand by him, right, against the captain. But do they? No. Ultimately, they just let, they, you know, they let him go. Just as on his first sea voyage to England, the white men on the ship joked and told him they were taking him home to Africa, right? So he kind of learns also not to trust promises from white people, right? There are a lot of ways in which he kind of points out here, like much like Clarkson was making that distinction between Christian and heathen, right? Or like from the African's perspective. Equiano, who is himself a baptized Christian, is making a similar kind of argument about English hypocrisy. If you look on page 108, he says, in seeing these white people did not sell one another, I was much pleased, right? But then what's the, what's the implied but there? In seeing these white people did not sell one another as we did, I was much pleased. What's the implied but? But they sell them. Yeah, but they do sell people like him. If we look on the uh, bottom of page 109, he talks about obtaining his freedom. For though my master had not promised it to me yet, besides the assurances I had received that he had no right to detain me, he always treated me with the greatest kindness and reposed in me an unbounded confidence. He even paid attention to my morals and would never suffer me to deceive him or tell lies of which he used to tell me the consequences, that if I did so, God would not love me. So that from all this tenderness, I had never once supposed in all my dreams of freedom that he would think of detaining me any longer than I wished. And this is right before he tells us about Pascal forcing him into a barge at the point of a sword, right? With none of his stuff. And then taking him down river and selling. So what is he taught, or what is he trying to suggest about the promises that have been made to him by white people. He never really comes out and says this directly. They're all false pretenses and promises. Yeah. Yeah, he's making the argument here that every time he he every time he's trusted a white person, they've screwed him. 
And he's able to make this point with a good deal of eloquence and without um, any kind of direct attack. Right? It's all kind of indirect. But it's what the language suggests, right? That oftentimes, like the, the, the bit that's left out, like the but in the statement about selling people, um, right, what's implied is more important often than what's actually said. So, what do y'all think of all this? Like, what, what, um, was there anything that was in Equiano's narrative here that struck you that I hadn't covered? Or anything that you thought was particularly kind of interesting or weird that I had to talk about. I'll give you a minute to think about it. seeing a lot of head shaking. Colin, you, 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 do you know the poem? I've read it before. It's been a while. Okay. I do know of the poem because I recognize the quote, the quotes from it. Out of yes, he's, yeah, he's quoting from Milton's Paradise Laws, yeah. right? And on the one hand, this is important because it's demonstrating his own mastery of English literary and cultural poetry. He's like, I know English literature well enough to quote this poem. The Paradise Lost being as relevant and known a poem as it is today, especially. Yeah. Because the references to Paradise Lost just in popular media alone today is very mm -hmm. prevalent. Yeah, I mean, so, so much so that they largely go unnoticed. Right. Um, it's just kind of like become part of our cultural wallpaper. Um, but does anybody know what the do you remember what the basic plot is, Colin, of Paris Lost? Like, what's going on in the column? I know a large part of it. I don't remember exactly what's going on throughout the poem. I know a large part of that is the descriptions of someone's own um, um, No, I can't remember exactly what okay. it is right now. Okay, so, yeah, so yeah, th these are from descriptions of hell in Paris Lost. Right. right. So the poem starts with the rebellious angels led by Satan being cast out of hell, out of heaven, right? Into hell. And the basic plot is Satan being excluded, right, from this new, this, you know, this beautiful new world that's been created and plotting how to bring about its downfall, right? How do I take these two new creatures that have supplanted me in the favor of God and trick them into doing something that will bring about their own destruction, right? So it's essentially, like, it's essentially about the expulsion from Eden, right? And I think that whole theme about the whole theme of expulsion from Eden is particularly relevant to a narrative written by a former slave who had been taken as a child from his home in what is now Nigeria and then moved halfway across the world um, 
and made someone else's property, right? So, you know, which character in the poem he identifies with, I think, you know, maybe matters less than the kind of general sense that he, uh, he, he chooses a, a poem that is about being pushed out of somewhere. All right. <clears throat> That's time. We're at 140. Okay. So, um, the big things I want you all to carry forward for next time are this idea of defamiliarization. This is going to be important with Wordsworth and Coleridge. They're going to be doing similar things. Um, and we may not immediately get into more discussion about alternatives.